Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second half of the today's program. My name is Alexander Senichev. I am postdoc at Purdue University, and I will moderate our next event. I'm very happy to introduce our very special event called Engage Science Communication Workshop that will be provided by uh, Zorin Adamatei, who is a professor of communication and associate dean of research and graduate education in the College of Liberal Arts at Purdue University. And also Dr. Neil Dilley, who is a research scientist in Bergman Technology Center at Purdue University. And this workshop, um, they will present an innovative approach to science communication, uh, which focuses on violation expectations and learning. And the theory of the presented approach of the storytelling is derived from information theory and the psycho psychology of novelty. If you have any questions to our speakers, please feel free to type them in the Q&A chat and also on YouTube chat. So welcome everyone. And with this, I hand it over to our speakers. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for uh, making time to come uh, join us. Uh, um, got our conversation about uh, engaged science communication. Engaged science communication, I want to emphasize. It's not just about you know, science communication. There are many ways to do science communication. And there are many possible ways, you know, we want to focus on engagement. So the big question that we have for you today is, for us, you know, the big question that I'm trying to, to answer with you today is, what is engaged science communication? By the way, I'm Soren Adamate. Uh, Alex just introduced me. I'm a prof here at Purdue University. Uh, I've been teaching for many years uh, in the School of Communication, where recently became a research, uh, an associate dean of research. And uh, in, in this capacity, I started collaborating with the uh, Burke uh, uh, Nanotechnology Center with Ali Shakuri and with Neil Dilley, my, my partner in crime, uh, trying to rethink how we train our graduate students to tell the story of their research in such a way that they get, they, they, they get, they get the best job they can get. Uh, so what, what you'll hear from us today has to do not only with making people better or making scientists better communicators, but making them better communicators for the purpose, which is to engage an audience, to attract attention, and uh, you know, to get noticed in a variety of contexts, not just at conferences. Actually, conferences are the least of our concern here. You know, our concern here is to train our students to be able to communicate to non-scientists or to people who are in leadership position and scientific organizations who know nothing about your scientific domain. Uh, these uh, uh, thoughts are just a, just a brief introduction to what we're gonna talk about and how we're gonna do it. But before we uh, get in the, uh, a little bit deeper into the conversation, I would like to uh, allow, uh, again, my collaborator, Neil Dilley, to see, say a few words from us, a scene from his perspective about our collaboration, the goal of what we're trying to do and all that. And then we'll, you know, we'll switch to the topic of the day, which is how to do uh, engaged science communication. Neil? All right. Thanks, Soren. Hi, everyone. I'm Neil. I'm research scientist here at Burke for about five years now. And I've had the pleasure of getting involved in the Shark Tank uh, science communication um, and the second go around. Uh, Sorin and Ali Shakuri did the first and uh, I came on board during the second time. And as somebody with a background in physics uh, studying arcane things, uh, I really have learned to appreciate over the years the importance of rising above the process, the details of the process and um, identifying identifying the why um, and the, the, the connection and realizing slowly, you know, and I'm kind of the initial, uh, one of the guinea pigs here, you know, what we're talking about is, is storytelling always, you know, and um, the assumption is that our audience will always be uh, engaged and will always be interested because who was our audience? They were our instructors uh, when we were undergraduates. There are advisors when we're graduate students. Our, our lab mates. And uh, gradually we have, we 
we, we graduate from that. And we need to go into a world where we need to convey the importance of what we're talking about, whether it be science or, uh, or, or more generally scientific culture. And that's so important and getting more important. So as a person who's been around and kind of seen, um, seen the challenges, the real challenges in science, uh, I thought it was a great opportunity to, uh, when Soren said with Alex, why don't we do something with the Quantum Science Center? Because talk about an area where we have uh, real challenges in conveying what's going on is quantum. I mean, all of us have our challenges with it. And uh, so I think it's a really wonderful thing. Uh, this being kind of our third iteration, we are learning more as instructors about how to do this. Uh, and uh, there's a very interesting experience we had, and I hope we can share this with you as our speaker, uh, graduate student Pratik Kashyap, uh, who is from ECE and, and outside of quantum, but um, that makes it kind of interesting. We worked with him a bit, a lot actually, and um, were, saw a great uh, transformation in, in his, in his uh, presentation. Um, and we worked with the other students here, and uh, Zach will, Martin will be pre presenting. Um, it really is an interesting process of, um, of uh, conveying uh, how to get from A to B, how to go from a very process-oriented, um, uh, detailed conference-type talk to one about product and, um, and really about uh, a story. Um, and so we look forward to more of these, and I'm just really uh, happy to, to uh, be involved with this. Um, so uh, we have, there is an online course that has been developed and that is on the Brightspace for Purdue. It's Engaged Science Communication and that's sort of the playbook for this. Um, and that's uh, evolving also. Sorin and uh, our colleagues from Polytechnic have developed that. And uh, I think there's great, uh, it's really a great uh, um, um, script for this. Um, but it is a very interactive process. I think we can all agree that uh, this required a lot of interaction, a very social thing. So uh, kudos to those who've done this in, in this challenging time of COVID. So um, yeah, we appreciate those guys, folks working with us. And uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very social uh, process and we're lucky to have Sora in here to guide this. Um, Soren, I can go and introduce uh, Pratik if you want, or if you want to circle back on a few things before we get into it. Yeah, let's uh, let's give uh, our listeners a little bit of uh, a little bit of context, so they better understand uh, what we're trying to do here. Um, first of all, what you what you will see, uh, you know, when Pratik will present his presentation, uh, will present his uh, his ideas, will be a little bit of a Oh, I wish. Uh, a little bit of a magic act, I wish. In the sense that there will be a before and after, right? And uh, unlike magic acts, I would like to tell you what's in the black box. What, what went in the before, or what went in, in turning the before into the after? Both, both Partik and, and Zach, right? They, they are going to be careful. So, uh, so what is in the box? You know, what is our method for training graduate students, especially graduate students, but you know, if our colleagues want to go through this process, I would invite them to, to consider this. But especially for graduate students, you know, what goes into training them into engaged science communicators? Okay, so the idea here is that, A, we want to help uh, a, a science storyteller identify, first of all, identify the value proposition. Now, you probably know this from your own work. You know, whenever you sit, sit down to write a paper, you need, you think about the so what of the paper, right? Uh, so that, you know, the reviewers will shake their head and say, yeah, this is a contribution that deserves to be published. But when we talk about engaged, engaged science communication, the value proposition should be much, much, much more tangible, broader and understandable to a lot more people than you usually consider uh, when you write the paper. So the very first step an engaged science communicator should do, and this is what we do with our students, is to think about the, 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 the ways in which what, that which they propose changes even a little bit the way we think their field, 
No, that their problem, their field, and the world in reverse order, right? So we invite them to think about the way in which what they do changes, contradicts more specifically what the world knows about you know, the process that they study. I know this is a very tricky uh, process because many, many uh, advanced uh, uh, scientists nowadays work in very narrow fields where progress is measured in uh, uh, nanometers, right? Or picometers rather than leaps and bounds. And uh, it's not always very easy to tell, uh, you know, how much uh, more you have pushed the field. Or, you know, you might think about yourself as a uh, marginal contributor that, you know, adds to the general effort. But by the end of the day, what you do and how you do it should change the world and should violate something that we know about the past in a certain way so that, you know, your work is worth its while. I, I presented a, a couple of ideas related to identifying, uh, um, you know, contradictions or identifying ways to contradict the, the present state of affairs to, to, to the group of students in the past. I don't want to bore them to death. You know, probably many of them are here. But uh, for those who weren't here, I just want to say something uh, to this effect. You know, if you think about science as a progressive act of making new data uh, fit, right, uh, into a theoretical framework. You know, you probably understand that, you know, you do it not just by, you don't, actually don't do it by truncating or forcing the data into theories. You do it by changing the theories. So most often what we are after is changing structural theories in such a way that they better explain the data at hand. And this, this contradiction sometimes is, is quite simple to do because they're not, there isn't an infinity of ways in which the data fits the theories or vice versa. Uh, mnemonically and epistemologically, from the viewpoint of the theory of science, actually at the highest level when we engage in data validation or you know, theory validation, what we do is we look at what we have and we try to determine if the things that seem to be many are in fact one or vice versa. The things that seem to be one should be actually explained by many things. That things that seem to be uncorrelated are correlated, right? That things that seem not to make a difference do make a difference and so on and so forth. So, you know, the contradicting assumptions uh, you know, in science is very much about, you know, improving theory with new data. But then when it comes to explaining how you go about doing that, that's when things become really, really, really difficult because what is known about the data, what data, what cancers data, how data works, right? And what the theories are and how they work and how, what their specific terms are, you know, is, uh, is very abstract, has become very, very, very abstracted. And you cannot, try as you may, you cannot simply say, you know, you know, my predecessors thought that, you know, quadru, the quadriceps, you know, fields of 17th degree, you know, were actually of a polynomial higher level relevance and all, you know what I mean? I'm, obviously I'm making it all up, right? But, you know, you, you cannot say that because you're losing about 90% of the audience and only, uh, and of the 10% that's left, probably only 1% understand what you're talking about. So after you identify, you know, what's the contradiction that you can relate to somebody that's in your field, then you need to find a metaphor that captures in the most, uh, in the most immediate and a widely explainable way, how your contradiction really works what your contribution really is. So what I'm trying to do with our students, with our learners, is to advance them from, from identifying their value proposition to translating the value proposition into a language that makes sense for everybody at the same time. Now, uh, the process of engaged storytelling, uh, storytelling doesn't stop with finding a clever metaphor to explain, you know, what you are doing and how you are doing and how what you do changes everything. And then after you establish this common ground, then you can dive 
into the science and the scientific details of what you do so that you establish your credibility. So there is a part of that in my recipe as well, right? But without the metaphor, you are not really communicating in an engaged way to, to the world. You are only communicating to a very narrow spectrum of connoisseurs, people who know what's going on. And even among those, only very, very few can really appreciate the finer points of, that you're trying to make. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, struggling here and we're struggling in a good way with the idea of bringing people to the surface and making them shout to the world their message in such a way that is not, you know, muffled by, by, by the water in which they were sunk up to that point. All right, so this is, this, is why, this is our method by and large. Now, there's a lot more to it. Maybe toward the end, I'll show you a little clip, kind of give you a better uh, view of how our you know, method of teaching works. But uh, I think that the best, best way to, to go about this is to show and tell, right? So as, uh, as, as we mentioned before, we worked to, with two graduate students very closely. Uh, uh, and we started with, uh, uh, their projects, the way they thought about them and the way in which they were ready to communicate to this uh, specialized audience. And we tried to turn those otherwise excellent conference, specialized conference presentations into something that is, comes closer to what we consider to be, you know, engaged science communication. And uh, along the way, we tried to teach them all these tricks, contradict, uh, show relevance, uh, uh, find metaphor, communicate with metaphor, go back to the science, come back and, you know, connect to the real world. Okay. So let's see, let's, let's see the, 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 the magic uh, act now. So who are we starting with, Neil? I think uh, we should start with Pratik Kashyap. Yes. Um, from yeah. UCE. Uh, Pratik studied, um, um, the uh, yeah, used MRI to study mild traumatic brain injury, and uh, so we. Spent well, let's some... not give too much away. Let's not give yeah. too much away. Oh, okay, you know? let's not do Actually, that, right? <laughs> I just yeah, attempted, right? Let's not do right? that because you know we spoil part of the fun. So, Pratik, are you there? Exactly. I am here. All right, Pratik, wonderful. Now, Pratik, remember, you know the trick here. You know we're going to play some tricks on your mind, right? You know, so we're gonna start with you in a state of wakefulness, right? So what I want you to do first is to give us uh, your classical conference style presentation in the quickest, most technical manner you can, right? The way we, we, we listened to it many, many uh, weeks ago, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and let's do it with the visuals, right? So if you can bring up the, the, the screen, uh, uh, the slideshow on the screen. Uh, Pratik, are you able to do it? Uh, uh, or let, let me actually bring up the slideshow. Do we want to use the YouTube video or directly go with the... The, the old one, you mean? Yeah, for the before take. Yeah, if you have it handy, yeah, we can play it. We, we can play it because that's, you know, a little bit more constrained. Yep. Uh, Neil, I believe I shared it with you. And if your co-host, it should be easier for... Oh, wait, I'm also going. Oh, okay. Um, let me get that then. Uh, I had pulled up something else. I pulled up the slides from you. Um, um, and uh, let's see here. All right, give me one minute here, guys. Um, so, um, While they uh, do that, I'm gonna share with you all a series of videos that go, uh, ooh, that uh, 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 form the infrastructure of my uh, engaged science communication course. Uh, they are all on YouTube and they include about uh, 12 uh, short, uh, five to three to five minute uh, clips that present different perspectives on, on, on engaged uh, data and science storytelling. You know, it starts with two little stories that give you a broader introduction to how everything works. And then there, there are the other videos now. Um, okay, did you find it, uh, Neil? 
Yes, I have found it, and uh, I'm going to try to share the screen. Um, okay. See if I can do that to this. Um, and can you see the screen? Yeah, everything's fine. And let's see if we so can. So again, hear everybody, this is the before. Right. This well, is maybe... typical science communication. Let me see if I can get the sound also. Can you hear his sound? Guys? Soren, did, did you hear the, the sound? I, I did not hear any sound, no. All right, I might need to uh, consult with somebody who um, no? can help me with the, uh, with the audio. I, I uh, Alex? Can I? Uh, let me probably try to share it, and maybe I can use my speaker. I believe we ran into the same issue in one of our meetings. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Let me just do that. Mm. All right, just checking the sound. Is it audible? Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, well, yours works. Just, uh, just pump it up a little bit. Everybody, and welcome to my talk, Neuromorphometric Analysis of Collision Sport Athletes. Essentially, I'll be talking about two concepts and applying it to a data set of collision sport athletes. Collision sport athletes can consist of any athletes playing sports such as soccer, football, etc. The concept I'll be delving into is known as neuromorphometry, which is pretty much understanding the evolution of the neurohomostasis using a morphometric approach or understanding the shape, intensity, and how they evolve over time and with space. Core science of my raw data basically uses the T1-weighted uh, magnetic resonance imaging that is collected or is also termed as a spin lattice, thermal, longitudinal relaxation time gained from magnetic, nuclear magnetic resonance species when placed in an MRI scan. The novelty of my approach is that we'll basically be looking at morphometry or volumetric changes for a region-based study. I'll be normalizing it using my baseline MRI scan. So essentially it's a normalized uh, approach that gives you values that are basically relative errors in time. This essentially provides patient-specific analysis, uh, permits longitudinal analysis, it's region specific, and it's piloted on an MTBI data set. More of an analogy that can help us understand what exactly the math behind all of this neuromorphometry is, is when we apply it to the US electoral college system, essentially understanding or capturing a country's opinion as to who should be their leader or their president cannot be determined by a popular vote. It's done using the electoral college system that uh, equally weights or has a representation uh, equivalent to the United States Congress. So there's a local or a spatial element that factors in that adds up to the grand mean or global, global country's vote. Essentially, when you look at the final output, which is the country's sentiment or who's going to be the leader, I'm, I'll translate it to the neural health prognosis. Uh, on a final level, a person's vote, because my raw data is T1 relaxation, that's pretty much what a person's vote would be. It's the T1 relaxation of the nuclei. Looking at a level higher in the hierarchy, you look at a region of interest volume, that'll be a county's representation, then a state's con uh, congressional representation will be a tissue volume, as regions of interest uh, aggregate to a tissue, and finally, all the tissues aggregate to the brain to give you your final neural health prognosis. Uh, keep in mind that the final answers or the volumes that I get are normalized volumes, so they are not a binary uh, measure. To convert it to a binary measure like a voting policy, we need to apply a classifier at the end to make this analogy uh, more or less streamlined between the two use cases. Essentially, that's what I'm doing. It's a spatial temporal localization approach and uh, applying it to the mild traumatic brain injury data set. Uh, simple math, but it adds up 
uh, over time and space to actually give you a meaningful result with a high degree of specificity and also a higher degree of detection when it comes to this pathology of myotraumatic brain injury. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Pratik. Thank you very much. Now, uh, for the benefit of the audience, so this uh, version of his presentation, um, it's a little bit spiced up with some uh, metaphors, so it's a little bit of, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, more broadly understood uh, 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 social, if you want, explanation of what he does. But as you could see, the beginning was uh, very much driven by the science and the science alone, more important by the application of the science, such a way that we did not quite even see where the novel application was. And also the connection between the metaphor and the novelty of what he does was relatively loose, right? And by the way, there was another version that had absolutely no metaphor <laughs> in it and probably we should have given you that draw just to kind of give you an idea of where, where we started. But that's, that was the before. Now, let's try to now uh, take a look at the after, right? You know, at a presentation that focuses from the get-go on the, on, the, on, on, on the metaphor and on contradicting what we do and we do not know, and then uh, continuing with the science and coming back to the uh, relevance of the research for the world outside. All right, so Pratik, are we ready for this second part? We are ready. And Absolutely. Well, I'll give it all to you now. All right, thank you. Folks able to see my screen? Yes, we can. Ready. So hello, everybody. Uh, Pratik Kashyap here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about something that is very close to my heart and constantly drives my mind. It is about quantifying safe standards for athletes involved in collision-based sports with the broader goal of understanding their overall brain health. Let's look at the numbers first. An average adult human brain has about 86 billion neurons with over 100 trillion synapses or conjunctions, especially in the cerebral cortex. Modern imaging captures these microscopic behavior of the brain at a sub-millimeter resolution to help us understand the neural dynamics non-invasively. Communicating the intricacies of my methods can be best done by exploring this analogy of measuring the brain as if it were a country. The number of people in a country is a few orders lower than the number of neurons in the brain. Gauging the opinion of the people can be similar to quantifying the neural activity in the brain. A brute force approach to measure a country's opinion, say the United States, would be to elect her president using the national popular vote as opposed to the electoral college's approach that factors in a spatial factor, which is the representation of the states in the United States Congress. A grand mean aggregate doesn't give us the right idea as it does, doesn't factor in the local diversity and specificity. The method I propose does something similar in the sense it does not allow a bias from the regions of the brain or the country to overpower the true spatial diversity of the underlying change. Here the change is being quantified by the study of morphometry for a neural setting, aka neuromorphometry. A direct application of my algorithm to the electoral college symbolic analogy can be brought about by introducing a binary classifier to the region specific local volumes that I do calculate for the brain. The political diversity of the people is not simply captured by just the spatial specificity. States evolve over time to be divided and in some cases swing their opinion from one party to another, which can very well decide the final vote. Quantifying this longitudinal change is another novelty of the method that I propose. Combining the spatial specificity and temporal evolution of complex systems and measuring them using my method via a normalized approach provides us with a deeper, more finer understanding of the underlying phenomena. Here, I have demonstrated my algorithm to quantify the regional volume change of brain tissues for athletes involved in collision-based sports such as football and soccer. Essentially, it promotes patient-specific and region-specific longitudinal analysis on this mild traumatic brain injury dataset. Delving a bit more into the core science of my raw data, the T1 weighted magnetic resonance image captures the spin lattice longitudinal relaxation of the nuclear magnetic resonance species for a three dimensional grid at a sub millimeter or one millimeter isotropic resolution. 
different tissues have different T1 relaxation values, thereby helping us to understand the biological distribution non-invasively as opposed to post-mortem analysis on a petri dish. And finally, a glimpse of my primary application. The need to study this pathology and drive more research to understand it better is driven by the fact that about 50 to 90% of these hits, whiplash, trauma of various forms to the head and body go undocumented, close to the number of voters who don't cast a ballot. They are only recognized when they present with any symptoms, which in most cases can be too late to mitigate permanent long lasting chronic change. My method helps us capture these changes with a higher degree of spatiotemporal specificity and helps us inch closer to a solution using neuromorphometry. Thank you to my advisors, my family, friends, and colleagues for supporting me every step of the way. This has been a really enriching experience and I thank Soren and Neil for including me in their pilot. Thank you so very much, Pratik. This is uh, this is very good. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And I, I hope that the audience appreciated as well. You know how much better and how much more integrated uh, the story has become uh, as you try to put uh, that which was more immediately communicable and understandable first, and uh, uh, the the science not second. But the science in, in, the, in, the, in the role that it, it needs to play, which is that of supporting you know, your broader idea and the difference you make. Probably this is the, the thing that, that, that struck me the most when I listened to your second iteration, which is that science, although it's very important, you know, it plays a different role. It's not an incantation anymore, right? Science is not just a way to, you know, you know, to, to talk to a limited number of people, but to convince everybody who listened to you that what you're doing is legitimate, is rooted in serious research, and you know, your novel approach is not only interesting but justified. Okay, right. Uh, uh, one other uh, a point I'd like to make is that in between the two versions. You know, critique advance between a presentation that uh, initially, very initially, was called neuromorphometric analysis of collision sport athletes, right, to measuring the brain as if it were a country. So, in the process, what we did and what we worked really hard on was to switch from, again, from the science to the metaphor right off the bat, right off the bat. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm wondering if we have any questions at this point, any uh, observations, uh, uh, any, any, any perspectives on what we're saying? I, I wanna make sure that we have not uh, lost anyone along the way. So far, I don't see any questions in our chats, but uh, okay. probably they will come later and then I will let you know. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully, you know, the, the points we made so far are very clear. Just to recap, you know, uh, our method of uh, uh, teaching engaged science communication relies on identifying value proposition, translating the value proposition in a very abstract uh, uh, proposition where you know you're trying to figure out what exactly are you doing how are you changing the world uh, the world of knowledge by saying that what was considered to be one is many what is many is one what's correlated is not correlated and so on and so forth and then applying this basic fundamental uh, um, um, explanation to a metaphor uh, taken from everyday uh, life uh, knowledge experience and then uh, providing this to you, your listeners as a key to understand, to understanding what you are doing uh, 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 in, in, in your day job, so to speak. Okay, now uh, let's uh, invite now Zach, Zach Martin to, uh, to go through the same process. Now he is much uh, closer, uh, his area of research is much closer to what you guys do. Uh, is uh, an uh, emerging uh, quantum uh, uh, scientist and quantum engineer, right? 
And uh, again, like before, we are gonna go through the two, fa the two phases of uh, uh, his work. And we're gonna start with version one, which actually in this case will be devoid of any, uh, of any metaphors, right, Zach? Yeah, these slides are, these are just sort of the preliminary outline slides that we've been working on. So yeah, even yeah. The, the first step is actually uh, quite unpolished. <laughs> yeah, but that, that which is okay because, you know, you know, they're unpolished in one way, but at the same time, they're a very solid presentation yes. of a scientific project. Not, he, he will not BS us, right? You know, right. He, he believes every single word, you know, in what he said here. So, Zach, right. take it away. You know, you're yeah. talking, sure. we're talking Good. now, you know, science. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Yes. All right. So, my first title was Making Quantum Light with Metal or Plasmatics for Indistinguishable Photon Generation. So the, the big question with a lot of the quantum technologies that we're developing is, well, why do we want to use quantum in the first place? What advantage do we gain? And in a lot of ways, the sort of the development of quantum computing and quantum information protocols mirrors what has happened in the past as new technologies replace old ones, such as steam power is replaced by the internal combustion engine. And in the last century, analog computing was replaced by digital computing and integrated chips. So what we're finding now with current computing technology is that there are limits to Moore's law. There are limits to, to the number of transistors that we can fit on a silicon integrated chip. And there are also limits to fundamentally what classical computers can do in a reasonable amount of time. And we see for that certain types of problems um, and for certain types of problems that are especially important, such as des designing new materials or discovering new drugs, quantum algorithms can run millions of calculations at the exact same time. Um, so there's an exponential speed up over classical computing. So then the big question is, well, why have we not achieved quantum computing yet? There are some promising developments, but so far we don't have this million qubit uh, operating threshold that you need to really truly see quantum advantage for the, the types of problems we would like to solve. The answer really is that quantum states are incredibly fragile. They're very sensitive to fluctuations in the environment. Um, and this also depends on the type of qubit. And there's this interesting paradox that was pointed out to me when I first started working with quantum computing is that for the types of qubits that you have more control over, such as the superconducting qubits that Google and IBM use, trapped ions, such as at Honeywell, or solid state defects, which is, I, I bolded that because that's what we work with, the less time the quantum state is preserved. That's because if you have more control over a qubit, that means it interacts with either the magnetic fields or electric fields more strongly, so you can control the state more readily. But that, that also renders it more sensitive to the environment. However, if the qubit doesn't interact as strongly, i.e. the quantum state is less fragile, it lives for a much longer time, that means you have less control. Uh, and the example that I would use for this are photonic qubits, because once you initialize a quantum state and you encode that into a photon and send it off, it's just going to keep flying and it's going to stay in that state until it interacts with matter. And so the overarching goal of our research is to marry light and matter qubits to get the most of, best of both worlds. Uh, and to do this, we want to enhance the interaction between light and matter. And so how do we do this? How do we enhance light matter interaction? Um, sometimes this needs to be pointed out to people is that light and matter actually don't usually couple very strongly. Uh, one example I bring up is the, the, the defect center that we've worked with quite a bit, the nitrogen vacancy center that lives in Diamond. Its native lifetime is something like 20 to 30 nanoseconds, which is for the for a time scale of atomic defects is actually quite long. So we take advantage of a, a phenomenon known as the Purcell effect. Uh, the Purcell effect tells us if we modify the electromagnetic environment around the defects that we're interested in, we can enhance the rate at which they give off photons. And we in particular use nanophotonic structures to do this. So the Purcell factor, which is the, the number of times that you've uh, enhanced emission of photons to the far field, scales roughly by Q over V. So Q is the quality factor of whatever structure you're working with. It, it, it's a, it's a uh, a metric that engineers use to, to quantify resonators divided by the volume. Um, and so what's really great about plasmonics, and that's the primary approach that we, we follow, 
uh, is it allows us to create cavities that have very, very, very small V, something on the order of, of nanometers. So we can really shrink down the cavity volumes uh, to quite a small size. Um, and we have some, some theory that shows that the careful design and careful consideration of, of a certain geometry of plasmonic nanostructure uh, in principle allows us to achieve up to a million times lifetime shortening. Um, this is sort of in the ideal case, what we've, what we've shown in experiments, and we have some experiments where we've achieved even faster emission than what's shown in this paper, uh, is by coupling the nitrogen vacancy center, a defect that we're interested in, we can achieve really dramatic lifetime shortening, and we can even modify the structures during the experiment to shorten the lifetime even further. And so, okay, so how does this make qubits? How does this relate back to what we were talking about before? Conventionally, uh, to preserve quantum coherence or to, to prevent quantum states from breaking, you cool down your defect to something on the order of four Kelvin or liquid helium temperature. And in some cases you have to go all the way just above absolute zero. And this extends the coherence time. It extends the time that the quantum state lives for without breaking or without the phase being lost. Um, so our approach is actually to not worry about the environment. We, we're trying to operate at room temperature or at the very least uh, above four Kelvin um, so that the environmental noise is still present, but with plasmonics, with, with enough lifetime shortening, we can actually beat the phasing processes. So we can enhance the emission so such that it's so fast that spontaneous emission or, or emission of a photon occurs before the phasing can even happen. And if, if we can achieve this, what that means is the quantum state of the emitter is the same every time that it's excited and the photons it produces are indistinguishable. And indistinguishable photons is a really, really powerful goal because it has been shown that you can do optical quantum computing with just linear components. So if we can produce indistinguishable photons at room temperature, we can achieve optical quantum computing at room temperature. And so going forward, we're going to capitalize on some of these uh, nanophotonic geometries that we've, we've shown a very substantial lifetime shortening. And we're going to work with, with defects such as the silicon vacancy center in diamond uh, that have some of the best optical properties uh, that we know about. And so yeah, that, that was what I have for my first presentation. I can um, stop sharing. Thank you, Zach. So uh, probably a... Uh... Uh, a, a very reasonable talk for a, um, a quantum conference. And uh, so Soren and I worked with him uh, in a few iterations. Um, so uh, Soren, did you want to say a few words about that? Oh, I think Soren is muted somehow. We can't hear you. Uh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. No. Uh, um, you know what, Neil? Uh I don't want to put you on the spot, but maybe you would like to say a few more words based on uh, your own experience with uh, uh, with, work, with with Zach and working with him to introduce his next field. Um, I can add a few words after that, but maybe mm -hmm. you would like to say something. Right, right. So, um, yeah, Zach was um, uh, stayed with this. You know, we we uh, we had an initial uh, group, a little larger, um, and I think uh, it was a um, one of the learning experiences I had with this, uh, and I hope that it's been rewarding also for Zach, though, is that it's been a um, the connection point from getting from A to B as far as making a conference talk and making a um, a, a good story um, and identifying the elements of story is really challenging, and that's what we're learning how to do a little better. Um, and trying to codify this is frankly hard. I mean, you have a charismatic personality like Soren who can bring this across. And again, this is all social, right? It's a very social uh, uh, event here. And look at me, I'm being unsocial by not showing myself here. Now I'm now here I am. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, this process is, is a very, um, I think it will be much, uh, it will enjoy a better, um, a better success when we're back in person and can do this uh, as in groups, in small groups, because this uh, 
is a process of iterating, um, going several times through and figuring out what it is that really is the, the driving uh, question. And one of the things that I think about in terms of, you know, this is always a question we have as, uh, in science. We hear Soren talking about transformation and uh, violating assumptions, and, and there's always this interesting resistance to it. And what I think is really interesting is that you look at the incremental process of engineering that happens, uh, for example, you have uh, small steps that taken, but there was a step that was taken at some point. They put a steam engine on wheels, right? You know, those things existed, but they put it on wheels and then society was changed, right? So uh, understanding how we violated something sometimes isn't even clear at the moment. Um, and so uh, learning to uncover that and say, okay, this has a promise of doing this, or this can transform, um, to me, there's a very interesting uh, aspect of this that we tend to be very de detailed and process oriented, as I said earlier. Um, but uh, what we can learn by stepping back and stepping back further out of it um, and going back in is that we can find out what it is that is um, the, the real new aspect of it. So um, I look forward to hearing Zach's uh, second take uh, on this, if you wanna pull that up. Uh, Soren, I um, uh, don't know if you, I mean, yeah, yeah. my perspective is as a scientist, right? So I'm a little bit on the, on the fence of this, uh, but I'm really interested to hear uh, Soren's. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I'll say probably a few more words after Zach presents, but I would like everybody uh, to refocus their attention a little bit on Zach's uh, presentation, core, core idea, the way he presented it just a few minutes ago, right? You know, for example, if we look at uh, the first uh, the first slide here, we see that now the presentation is called Making Light with Metal, a high-speed camera for quantum states, right? So right now, we, we have, uh, I mean, at this point, we have a metaphor. Now, Zach, do you, do you still have the other slide handy? So I'd like yes, to- Yes, I do. I'd like to, to bring people back to the past a little bit. Okay. Because, you know, yeah. the first iteration, I'll just pull up the other. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to make it a full screen. Just okay. you know. So the first iteration, you know, was called me making quantum light with metal plasmonics for indistinguishable photo generation. Now uh, you probably uh, understand what he's talking about. You are all distinguished quantum scientists and all that, but there's no metaphor in here, which prevents anybody outside this room from understanding, even starting to understand where Zach is taking us, right? Now the new one, the new version, you know, has a core central hard-coded metaphor, this high-speed camera that will help us, you know, first connect his ideas to a, a more common understanding, but also as you'll see, will allow him to dip down into the science again, all right? So, Zach, let's take it for a second spin. All right, so. Oh, shoot. Uh, can everyone see? Yes. All right. Okay, so as Soren said, this presentation is about making light with metal or a high-speed camera for quantum states. So, my research focuses on the optical properties of solid state defects in materials like diamond. So for instance, one of the uh, defects that I'm interested in is the nitrogen vacancy center in diamond. And what's really fascinating about these defect centers is that they can have quantum properties at room temperature. So what we would like to do is we would like to explore these quantum properties, in particular the types of light that they can give off. And we want to see what kinds of quantum states that we can encode into these defects uh, to develop new technologies like for quantum computing or for quantum information. However, the biggest problem that we have right now is that quantum states, as my title says, are quite delicate. So if we have our state here that uh, our defect is encoded in, any kind of interaction either with external electromagnetic noise or with vibrations in the quantum lattice due to thermal energy is going to lead to a process called decoherence. So the quantum state is going to be changed or the phase that we've encoded is broken. 
and we've lost the information. Mm -hmm. And so this is actually a really big problem because now we can't use the quantum state that we've prepared for computing or any other kinds of interesting studies. And so how do we get around this? The typical approach to being able to see quantum states, being able to preserve the quantum state, is we take the defect, and the material here is in diamond, we encode the information in it, but first what we've done is we've put it in a, in a cryostat and we've cooled it down to very, very cold temperatures. And so what cooling this down does is before we still had this, this uh, noise or this interaction due to the environment, but by cooling it to such low temperatures, we've blocked the interaction. We've slowed the, the environment down enough that the decoherence processes don't occur as often and we've extended the lifetime of the quantum state. But from an engineer's perspective, this is actually a bit less than ideal because cryostats are large and bulky. They take up a lot of space and you, you need a, to use a lot of energy to cool them down to such low temperatures. So we would like something a little more elegant that can be uh, scaled up a little bit more easily. And so again, we take our quantum defect here, we encode some information in it, but now we're operating at higher temperatures than you would use in a cryostat. Ideally, we would be at room temperature, and we're just not going to worry about the environment as much. And what our research right now focuses on is the equivalent of building a high-speed camera to capture this quantum state. And it's going to be so high speed that it's going to capture this quantum state before this decoherence process, this noise interaction can even occur in the first place. So just to put this in a little more theoretically rigorous ground, uh, this, on, this part of the diagram shown here on the left is kind of the conventional approach that you would use with a cryostat. You have your emitter that uh, transitions from an excited to a ground state and gives off a photon. And by cooling it down to cryogenic temperatures, what you do is you extend what's called the dephasing time. So this T sub depth right here. So that time is, as I said earlier, the lifetime of the quantum state, the state of time that it lives before it interacts with the environment and the information is lost. However, the option that we're pursuing here is called plasmonics. So I'll explain that in a little bit more detail here in a second. But with plasmonics, what we're hoping to do is not to alter the dephasing time, but rather we're going to take the time that the defect uh, lives in the excited state and reduce it so that the defect is going to give off a photon before dephasing can even occur in the first place. And so if it gives off this photon before dephasing can occur, what that means is the quantum state of the emitter is the same for every photon that it gives off. And this produces what are called indistinguishable photons. And this is really, really important for quantum computing because if you have indistinguishable photons, you can do optical quantum computing and you don't actually need all that much. Uh, you really don't need very complicated components to do optical quantum computing. And the goal, of course, for this would be to generate indistinguishable photons at room temperature, because then this enables actual room temperature quantum computing. So what do the actual high speed shutters that we were building look like? Uh, so these are the kinds of uh, nanophotonic structures that we're working on. This geometry here, shown on the left, is called a nano patch antenna. What this consists of is, is a silver mirror, an insulating spacer, and a silver cube. And then the diamond that contains our, our optical defect is situated right between them. So what this does is it, it tra traps the light from uh, the laser field that we use to excite it, and it confines it in a very small volume like this. And then another geometry that we're exploring is called the plasmonic watcher. So basically what we do is we coat the entire diamond with a, a silver layer, and it, it couples light to a type of surface wave. And this, these geometries, these nanophotonic structures that we're building enable us to take advantage of something called the Fresnel effect. The Fresnel effect tells us if we modify the local electromagnetic environment surrounding our defect, we can enhance the rate at which it gives off light, that rate of spontaneous emission that I showed a couple, uh, a couple of slides back. And what's really nice for us about the Fresnel effect is that this, the, that this factor, this Fresnel factor, the number of times that we can enhance the emission, uh, scales inversely with the volume. And plasmonics is perfect for this, this sort of approach because it scales inversely uh, with the volume. So what we've shown in theory here is that by careful consideration of, of the, the gap 
uh, or structure parameters, we can achieve up to a million times lifetime shortening. And we this is this is taken from a paper that came out last year. So we, we do see that in experiment, if we couple the defect center to these, these uh, gap plasmon modes or this, this nanophotonic structure, we can achieve actually quite substantial lifetime shortening, slipping on the order of four to five times. And we can even modify these structures further to shorten the lifetime even more. And so this, this is still an ongoing effort. We're still working on using different kinds of structures and different types of defects to produce indistinguishable photons. But it's quite promising because as I said earlier, this would enable optical quantum computing and not only optical quantum computing, but room temperature quantum computing. You wouldn't need this bulky expensive cryostat equipment and you could scale this up to build something like a quantum internet. You could have practical large scale quantum communication. Um, and quantum computing is also really exciting because for certain classes of problems, you can, you can solve uh, thousands upon thousands of equations simultaneously. Uh, and this lends itself really well to problems where quantum effects are quite strong, such as in designing new materials or drug discovery. So this is something that really could be as groundbreaking or as world changing as the steam engine or the internal combustion engine. So that's what I have. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, I'd really like to thank Soren and Neil, obviously, for all their help, as well as Alex Senechev um, for coming up with this metaphor in the first place, as well as the rest of the Purdue Quantum team. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so very much, Zach. Uh, thank you. Very to the point, very short, very cool, very inspiring. I'll give you the job if I had one. <laughs> uh, now, I'd like to remind the audience again that what we're trying to do here is not to turn uh, our uh, uh, apprentices into that which they are not, but uh, to help them sell their wares to a broader audience. Uh, that's why, to a certain extent, the two types of talks were similar, but in some vital aspects, they, they were uh, uh, different. Now, uh, a final uh, observation is that, you know, this process that we worked on uh, with uh, Zach and Pratik is, uh, can be calibrated as needed. Now, for the purposes of this conference, we kept the science at a pretty, uh, you know, sophisticated and complex level because uh, we did not want to disappoint anybody. Uh, but uh, things could be dialed up or down as needed, as such as that if you are going for a job at a pharmaceutical company, you know for sure that only there's only one quantum scientist in, in the room, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't want to go too deep. So you'll keep it higher and you'll talk the, the, the metaphoric language a little bit uh, for, for a little bit longer. Okay, and with this, I, I would like to stop and take your questions, ob observation, comments, uh, or anything you might have to say uh, about this. Uh, at the very, very end, again, I'll share some more resources with you in case you are interested. Yes, we have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, Pratik uh, briefly commented on this already, but uh -huh. I would like to read it out and maybe you, Zorin, and Neil could uh, provide more, yeah. more details. Well, so this is regarding the first student presenter. Um, there is a feeling that this is a matter of really knowing the audience. Uh, for example, you're not suggesting to present in the second way during the physics conference. Uh, the, meaning the same, my understanding, topic, but now to the physics conference. And is it correct that your techniques are more for non-experts? Well, yes and no. Yes, because I don't want to upset anybody. <laughs> no, because I really think that even scientific audiences uh, are quite diverse themselves. And there's a lot of, how should I put it? There's a lot of new knowledge that needs to be translated before it can make its fuller and deeper impact on, on, on the world. Now, for example, let's talk about Pratik's method. You know, sure, you know, he's, he comes uh, at the problem from an engineering perspective, if you want. Maybe, you know, much of the science he talks about is not as exciting and all that as some people can think it could and should be. But 
Uh, at the same time, you know, if he were to give his talk strictly at a very strict scientific level in a scientific environment, the impact that he does on his scientific audience might fail to make the mark that it should make, that he is really changing the rules of measurement game, right? You know, measurement, we never think about measurement as fundamental contributions, but sometimes they are, right? So, you know, I would encourage you actually to think very deeply and carefully about, you know, the, the ways in which you try to overcome the limitations of your very narrow field. Now, if you go to one of these uh, conferences that has superstars in it, especially the people who, you know, have made really big names for themselves, you'll notice something very interesting. Very often, they try to break the mold. They try to take the, tell the bigger story of what they do by telling jokes, right? You know, why wouldn't you, you know, follow their lead too? And why do you think they do that? I mean, they don't, you know, they are, they are as, as adept at the science of it as anyone else, right? They know the science as anyone else. Why do they need to you know, make those jokes. Well, they need to make those jokes, not because, you know, you know, they are not believe, but because they are trying to penetrate through the veil of, well, pretend knowledge, not to call it ignorance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great, uh, Sorry, And I, if I could add a little bit from my experience, um, and I'm sure the professors would um, echo this also, that you go to a colloquium, even it's a department colloquium, and everyone in their room is a physicist. Um, invariably, the first five or 10 minutes of that colloquium are where everyone's tuned in. Then the speaker sometimes goes into warp speed and they go beyond. But I always found those first five minutes to be where where the interest is. And, and that's where you can, well, it's where you're getting into the concepts. And going slowly through that, Stepping even if it's to a specialist audience, if you're going to step step back and take it from a new perspective, that's very fruitful because um, uh, it'll help you to rethink it. It'll help your audience to see things that you probably assumed everyone knew and, and they don't. And that's the interesting thing is there's a lot of less um, um, consensus on things than one would think. And so, um, yeah, this... Um, going at the higher level, at least to approach it from the higher level at first, is, is a very uh, it's a very fruitful thing to do. And then you're going to be writing proposals to people who are going to be reviewing them. And they're not going to want to hear you talk fancy. They're going to want to hear you talk to them and compel what you're doing is important. It's going to change something. And that's what it's really got to come down to. And that becomes the habit of these people who are really great speakers. And I think... Um, uh, Professor Boltaseva and Professor Shalev are both examples of that. When they give their talks, they they compel something uh, uh, in their research that uh, that the audience can relate to, and um, so that is a that's a very uh, big learning experience for people who go in to start writing grants. Is they realize, well, okay, this committee is not going to be wanting to uh, pour over my research and really. Uh, work their brains out they want to um they want to get it they want to get the message easy and they want to be compelled by it in the first page so um, those are very important reasons to re remember this that is your style you know to take this into your style of, of presentation so um just adding on to what what soren was saying there so so uh, uh if we have any other questions alexander did you uh, no, at this moment we don't have any further questions, mm -hmm. so we'll uh, we can continue yeah. uh, with the next part. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, I don't have much more to say. Tell you very honest, I don't want to bore people uh, to death. After you know, we uh, we 
we listen to these uh, great uh, examples of transitioning from pure communication, uh, science communication to engaged science communication. Uh, the, the, again, the only two uh, other details that I would like to add is that uh, our uh, materials are online. Uh, again, we have this uh, series of uh, video clips that give you several ideas as to how to uh, uh, massage your presentations, how to work with them. Uh, we have some tips for utilizing uh, uh, color, shape, and uh, imagery that some of you might find useful. Uh, there are a couple of modules that speak about ethics and how uh, ethics should be a part of uh, the scientific uh, process. Now, obviously, when you're a material scientist, sometimes you don't think about ethics, but there are always uh, uh, implications for just about everything we do um, uh, for uh, other people, for our life together. And uh, you need to uh, think about uh, the ways in which the materials you'll create, the, algorith that you'll cre the algorithms that you'll create will, might change the world. Um, I provided that uh, link uh, in the chat and uh, uh, um, I'll ask uh, Alex to uh, share that with you uh, by other means. And also uh, the full complement, the classes uh, that uh, we offer, I offer, and uh, uh, Alex, uh, Neil and I offer can be found uh, at uh, this uh, uh, link that I'm uh, sharing with you here now. And um, yeah, and uh, that's about it. It was a pleasure to listen to you all. And unless you have other questions, I guess we can, you know, take an advance. Uh, yes, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to type them or raise hand uh, and communicate with any uh, mean you're comfortable to. I'd like to just offer one thing as, as a resident there at Burke and, you know, I know this QSC is beyond Purdue, but, um, you know, I'm very, obviously very invested in this. And I know some of you uh, graduate students are getting to later on in your PhD and you're gonna to go to interview talks. And, and that may be a time when really this kind of thing will resonate uh, more. Uh, I'm happy to offer my help and feedback and in translating this course that's there online um, and and to provide you feedback for talks and bring whatever you have. Um, you know, we enjoy seeing the transformation. You don't need to bring a perfect finished talk. I want to work with people to um, so so that you can see uh, an improvement. And so I'm there at Burke and uh, I hope that uh, my information is also shared in the summer school. Um, so, um, you know, it's really a passion of mine to 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 help out here and um, you know this starting along this uh, science communication road with all of you. So just wanted to offer that up too. So all right, uh, of course, yes, we will share the information with all attendees, uh, links to video and. Um, online course as well as your contact details so if anyone has more questions or comments and would like to reach out to you uh, they would have this uh, opportunity so if there are no other questions i would like to thank you our speakers again for the wonderful workshop and i hope everyone enjoyed it and i would like to thank all the speakers of the today's session and of our first day of the quantum uh, summer school I also hope that you enjoyed all the presentations and thank you everyone. And we are looking to see you tomorrow for our second day. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you all, goodbye. Thank you. And with this, we will conclude our sessions today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, take care. Goodbye.